so yeah, my name is Dmitry. Thank you for joining. And today we will talk about remote work. I know it might be confusing because the initial schedule was different. This is more entertaining, I think. So uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some remote work stuff. But first, I always like to establish the goals for any talk I give. So you can make a conscious decision whether it's worth your time staying here or Andreas' talk that's happening right now might be more you know, of interest to you. So let's start by establishing those goals. First and foremost, we will discuss why we even need to talk about this topic, why we even need to you know, consider remote work. Then we will discuss those you know, do's and don'ts of remote work. And lastly, uh, we will look at how to get started if I'm able to convince you to even give it a try. Okay, all right. So, um, it's kind of a, quite a bit of material here, so the agenda will be quite helpful here. We will again discuss of uh, why the remote is even a topic to discuss. Then we'll discuss the benefit of remote work, so kind of stay on the positive side of remote work. Then I'll we'll have to acknowledge the negative side of things, kind of the dangers of remote work that come along with that. And lastly, how do you get started with the remote work, as I've said, if you're interested in doing so. All right, let's begin by discussing why remote work worth mentioning. And with that, it's always even important to ask you, why do we go to the office in the first place? Why does it matter to us? More often than not, we hear things like, you know, that's how we always done things, or, um, you know, how do I actually know that you're working? Especially if the manager says that, it's a, or at least they can think that, even though they might be saying, no, 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 you know, it's all about the value. That being said, more often than not, they at least think uh, that how do I know you're actually working from home? Or some people go, go more you know, specific and detailed, theoretical on you and say, it's all about deep collaboration. Uh, let's actually talk about those statements, those three statements I kind of, I've just made, and let's we'll talk about them in more detail. So those kind of pro-office misconceptions, basically the, kind of the misconceptions that might lead you to just stick to the office in the first place. So from that statement before, it's the fact that people call office a uh, main standard, then the fact that people think that Office is a requirement to actually track your work. And lastly, this deep collaboration notion. All right, let's start with the first topic, first kind of a point of the office being a standard. People like throwing standards around, the best practices. You know, the reason why I'm showing this picture of a person writing something down is that, you know, it's well known, or especially lately been kind of brought up on lots of forums that Socrates actually initially, and there been some mentioning of that. Socrates was against writing practices, writing books as a whole, because he was saying that it will uh, cause humanity to start forgetting things, that our memory will degrade, and will be just mindless you know, people who just read and write things. That basically was a step. If you were following him, the standard of just talking things out and memorizing stuff it might be a different world, though. Or another standard that people used to push, you know, before the cars were in the use, the carriage uh, drivers would be, you know, oh no, the cars would be polluting our streets and the noise will cause us the harm, so let's never use cars. It's this whole idea that the old is always better. It may be good for whiskey and wine, but in reality, when it comes for the evolution, we have to move along and question those standards, question those best practices. So let's look at another misconception of this tracking work uh, statement. Probably some of you don't recognize this picture, but hopefully actually none of you recognize this picture. But because uh, if you've had in, in this kind of a, a time clock in your IT department, I, uh, I actually want to talk to you more. But in reality, what this was, it's a big manufacturing, it was commonly used in manufacturing uh, factories where uh, when a person comes in, you probably, I've seen it in Simpsons, by the way. You come into work, you have a card, you punch it in, it types the time that you entered the workplace, and you punch out and you leave the workplace. That's how they were tracking your work. In reality, it's actually not they were tracking. You know, they say it's a tracking work. In reality, again, they are just tracking your time. They focus on the time rather than on real value. And it's not what matters. It's all about the value. Another misconception, again, that office, you know, people who are saying that we need to go to the office, pushing for is the deep collaboration statement. So what is this deep collaboration to begin with? Some of the definitions or at least explanations that I've read about is collaboration beyond task coordination. Uh, what it means is that if you ever work with a distributed team, 
and you end up doing things like stand-ups. More often than not, in reality, the stand-up ends up being, I just talk about my thing, and the single person, whoever, like a scrum master or a manager potentially, just coordinates tasks, assigns tasks, and that's basically the, you know, the end collaboration that many teams achieve. And they say, when you get to the office and do some whiteboarding, brainstorming, and things where you technically interact with each other is what they would call deep collaboration. So basically that next step forward from just simply assigning tasks to each other. So, into this point, though, to this deep collaboration point, can we collaborate remotely, though? I would say, of course we can, because we have technology, right? So the, when it comes to remote collaboration, again, we're already doing it, and we're doing it extensively. If any of you try to work remote, or at least try to work with distributed teams, we already all use Slack and emails. That's one step forward you know, to some sort of deep collaboration where you go beyond just task coordination. You might brainstorm, have a common channel, oh, and have this common thing where the reason why we go to the office again is to have those hallway conversations, right? Or water cooler conversation. That's why Slack would have like a random channel where people post cute GIFs or like what is it, the party parrot. That thing I love, you know? Um, so we're already doing that. And the asynchrony, you know, asynchrony is always better, especially when it comes to collaboration. What I'm trying to say here is, if you worked on semi-large, I wouldn't say semi-large team, but uh, in a semi-large company when you have multiple projects happening at the same time. And with those multiple projects happening, you're most likely gonna have a single representative of your customer, whether it's gonna be a project manager, product owner, whatever you wanna call them, but more often than not, I've seen that the single project manager would be responsible for tons of projects at the same time. They tend to stretch themselves quite a bit. So what happens is, yeah, you're all, in, in case of the office, you're all in the office, you're all in person discussing, uh, you know, five different projects at the same time. But then the project manager, the person, again, who's representing your customer, uh, ends up focusing only on one task, because they can't physically really lead all those five tasks at the same time and keep up with those. Because developers will, you know, after you discuss the initial requirements, developers will kickstart those that work, uh, and those five threads will be working asynchronously. And even though you had that initial discussion, that discussion is already long gone. So you've wasted time, unless you, you know, again, you have to prioritize your discussions that face time. And when you're working remotely, you're able to prior prioritize that precious in-person time that you get together with the team. But when you're always in the office and they say it's all about just collaborating constantly, more often than not, it's just a, you know, vanilla talk. So, but more importantly, let's actually talk about the modern office. Modern office is not as great as we might think. And I'm not talking about uh, the series though. Series are great. So, office and you. Open office is horrible. If, you know, I've actually been trying to read this uh, Peopleware. It's a fairly old book by, you know, by modern standards. But I would, what I was shocked about is I actually had to double check when it was published because even back then they were saying open office is a horrible idea. And now, especially in the past couple months, more and more you can find those articles that, oh yeah, open office was actually a bad idea. And I'm like, what? So, I mean, it always goes in cycles. That being said, open office, again, it's, there's so much, so much stuff going on. You have to invest into those noise canceling headphones. You're basically defeating the purpose. You're trying to isolate yourself while being in the middle of the crowd. Office perks that some offices try to buy you, basically, where they say, stay late and you can get dinner. It's not perks, it's bribes. They're bribing you for your time, uh, for your life energy, basically, to get you put some work in. And there is no real reason, there is no real science behind it that you'll be more productive by staying late. It's actually the opposite. And that's why the things like we say, oh, I've done so much work on a plane because I had no connection, no distractions. There is a reason, you know, for this statement. If you've ever been on a plane, you actually get to do some work. I don't know, watching, actually watch Shazam on a plane. But if you actually get to do some work, you know, you realize I've done the most of the work on a plane because, again, no distractions, no people, apart from your neighbors and stuff. But. But again, more importantly, work is just work. You know, it's not about your life revolving around office. It's ideally, again, your work revolving around your life. So you have to remember this point. And if you want to learn more in depth than those points I've just mentioned, this book, book is great. It's kind of a tip-based, you know, every chapter is independent. It's a nice read. 
So I've been kind of negative, bashing everything. Everything is horrible. Actually, everything is great. Uh, so let's talk about something positive. And with that, I want to move to the next point in our agenda and talk about benefits of remote work. So first and foremost, first and foremost, it's the freedom. Freedom, to me personally, one of the most important things in life. Especially after you, like, you know, initially we like think, okay, I have to, I have to make some money. Especially if you're in the U.S. and you have student debt, I have to make a lot of money because I have to pay that thing off. But after you, you know, you reach a certain point, you realize that it's really idea of being rich. It's not about how much material things you have, really. It's about how much freedom money can give you, or a place that. You know, the, your passport potential or your citizenship. I've moved from Russia to Canada for that exact reason, because I wanted the freedom of transportation and other things, of course. But freedom is essential. Value over hours. That's one of the benefits of remote, and we recognize that and start appreciating that. Office costs go down for the people, you know, for the employers. And again, another benefit for the employers would be the talent pool increases exponentially, if I can say that. So let's look at the first point a little bit in more details than just my personal experience. So it's uh, about freedom of location when it comes to remote work. It's about freedom of traveling. Is traveling double L or one L? I'll check that. Uh, freedom of being with your you know, loved ones and your family, your relatives, or whoever, uh, maybe your pets. Uh, and freedom of living, just living your life. So let's look at each of those points again in more detail. Has anyone, can anyone recognize this uh, truck? Just a regular truck. I know, it's like there is one over there as well, similar to this one. Okay, so if you haven't, it's fine. This is not just a regular truck from Mindhunter or something. No, no, no. In reality, this is actually a picture um, from an article about a guy named Brandon. He was an internet Google. It was, I don't know what year it was, but there were quite a few articles about this guy. So what basically happened is he got an internship at Google and he, to save money, ended up living in a truck in a parking lot. Probably heard this kind of uh, stories that the Google employee lives in a parking lot because there is unlimited food, there is also a gym shower, so everything is great. And he ended up saving, what was it, about 2,000 a month, which is, again, I don't blame him for this choice. I mean, he made actual calculations. I saw the math. Uh, that being said, if you look inside of this truck, it doesn't, I don't know, making that much money and uh, living here, I don't know, if you're saving for an island, that's maybe makes sense. That being said, again, I don't blame anyone. At the same time, the fact that he had to go to that office and because of that make the decision of living in track to save money while making a good salary, it's not something that I personally would prefer to do. And my personal story, I have a, uh, someone named Jim. It's an acquaintance of mine. Jim is a different name though. Uh, this person has a different name, but Jim, uh, he was working with me at some point and making a ton of money. Like a ton of money living in San Francisco, uh, which comes with the territory, obviously. And so because this person lived in San Francisco, uh, Jim lived with five other people in San Francisco itself. And if it goes even further, Jim lived in the kitchen of that apartment for years. And uh, again, it just, it, it, wa it was so weird to me. Again, you can't really relate to people at the same time. You can't put yourself on the spot, but you can think of yourself in the same situation and thinking that they were technically made, you know, to, be, to make the choice. I want to save for money because the rent in the Bay Area is insane at this point. So the fact that they had to make the choice is already a sad idea. And that's why remote really beneficial. So because we should be able to choose where we live. This is uh, Marcy Sutton. She's the uh, head of learning at uh, Gatsby GS. This is a track I would love to live in. See, she's also on a track, but she's like, you know, enjoying it somewhere in Canada which is great. I'm not even sure where those mountains are, maybe even here. But, you know, if I had to choose, like this is another picture she, she took while enjoying the time working remotely for her company. And if I were to choose between the two trucks, I know which one I will go for. Even though that one would have also, also have a shower and food in the next office, but I would definitely go for this one. So, when it comes to freedom of traveling, why do we need to talk about it? The reason that I'm, I can say the freedom of traveling is important to us is if you were to ask yourself, if you didn't have to work, what would you do? Or more importantly, what are you going to do when you retire? Because that's a common thing in people's minds. According to the kind of recent survey by RBC Wealth Management, blah, 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 uh, two thirds of Americans actually would love to travel when they retire. It's like a dream of the, you know, when I retire, I'm going to travel Europe or go to Australia or wherever. 
hopefully abroad though. It's actually a common theme, people want to travel. So, but why wait though? You know, it's, uh, we often make excuses, there is never a better time than right now. Um, obviously, we all have different circumstances, that whether it's, you know, life or, like, again, health, uh, family. But more often than not, again, there is a great story that I've read. Because I've come, on, again, people have different circumstances, but there have been one interesting story where people often tell me, because I have kids, oh, enjoy your travel while you can, because when you have kids, you're not going to be able to do that. There have been this great article about Behan Gifford and Jamie Gifford. Uh, they have about, they actually have three kids, and they went like on a sailing trip across Atlantic, I have no idea where, but they went on a very long trip, like a year at least long, and it was in no way disadvantage to their kids. They've learned to be independent, to learn, you know, new things, to be more broad, you know, open-minded, even just through this trip alone, because people need challenges. And uh, it's def if that's, again, it's not an excuse really, it's just what you feel comfortable. If your dream is to travel, discuss it with your loved ones, you can definitely find the time. If again, especially with our jobs, we have lots of opportunities, and I'll mention that in a second. Because again, it's freedom of being with loved ones, whether you travel it or you're doing it at home, it's figuring out the priorities for you. This tweet really, and there are lots of tweets like that. It's from David Welsh. Uh, he's a senior web developer at Mozilla, tweets a lot, great guy. But you know, this tweet kind of uh, representative of this idea that remote work really gives you an opportunity to make decisions and make priorities in life, not just like work, 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 work. Isn't that a song? Like, is it a Taylor Swift? T T Taylor Swift? Work, work, work. Okay, yeah, it's Rihanna, okay. Um, okay, but anyways, uh, this is like the complete opposite of that. And again, the po personal story why I was in Poland, I think a couple years ago, and I met some developer from, an advocate actually, from Estonia. And I was talking to him that, oh, why don't you move to Bay Area and make like a ton of money, because money is important, it's gonna be great for you with your skills. He's like, why would I ever do that? I live like on the coast of Estonia, I have, you know, my entire family is there, my parents are there, my friends are there, it's a student city, it's awesome there. And I'm like, and he basically just said something simple that we're extremely lucky with our jobs. Our jobs allow us for so many opportunities that most other jobs would never allow them to. And again, lastly, more importantly, it's the freedom of living, because life is about life. I've said it multiple times now, but again, it's not, life is not about work. And more unfortunately, we really remember that work, life is not about work at the moments that are more often than not are quite sad and negative. This has been kind of quite a bit on the news where Telltale, if you've ever played a Walking Dead or that uh, Wolf Among Us games, um, they basically laid off all their engineers and then he, like one of the engineers posted this tweet about the fact that really focus on yourself, on your life, on your health. And the gaming industry has this problem anyways of overworking a bit, but the last statement is what really matters here. Because again, it's not about wrapping your life around your work. It's, as I've said before, it's wrapping your work around your life. You have to fit one into another instead of just, you know, fitting your life always to match the work. And if you need more convincing, because again, why would you even listen to me? There are smarter people than myself, obviously. Bronnie Ware, she posted a great summary, like almost a, summary, a collection of essays on the top five regrets of the dying. She was basically interviewing uh, people in a deathbed, uh, mostly men, actually almost everyone was a man there who she was interviewing. But in particular, there was a thing where all men that she interviewed, all of them said the top regret was I was working too much. So, you know, you're not gonna lie when you're death bad. Death door, one of the idioms, you know, I'm ESL, I can, I can do that. All right, um, another, another benefit of remote work, it's value over hours. <sighs> when you go remote, you really are able to cut down on those professional meeting goers, you know. There are actually people who actually usually paid the most in some companies where they would constantly go to meetings. If you look at their schedule and it's completely packed, honestly, they don't really, there is no real value out of, that coming out of those meetings. And there are always those jokes on all those forums on, on Twitter where, we, like, you know, the C-level people gonna, like, five of them gonna sit in the room discussing $50 allowance for me expensing a book from Amazon, while that meeting gonna cost the company, like, thousands of dollars. Because one of those meetings is just actually extremely expensive. If you actually start counting, 
like 30 minutes meeting that happens every week with 10 people in the room. You count everyone's salary like per that, per, per that half an hour. It's actually going to be quite a pricey meeting. And ultimately, remote work, what I like the most about, it cuts down on those true enterprise developers who are just moving by inertia, by their charisma. Because more often than not, if you're with a company for a very long time, some engineers are amazing, but some stick around because of the, you know, the internal knowledge, or again, the charisma more often than not, where you know, they can talk their way through, or that creating silos. When you have remote work, those silos tend to be broken because you're going to reach out to a person, you're going to have that written communication that if you ask them a question and they've intentionally uh, prevented you from learning about something, that's going to be you know, caught up um, quite quickly. People will actually catch up to that and hopefully will uh, change that for the better. Because again, it's all about the value. It's all about the time that people try to track. Because value over hours is what matters the most. It's not how many, we used to work nine to five, how many, like, again, the time clock, right? You know, clock in, clock out. It's not about that. It's about the value you produce. People sometimes ask me, why do you work so little, like hour-wise? And I make lots of jokes. But in reality, it's about the value you produce. Um, obviously, office cost-wise, I don't even have to talk about that. Try to look at the Bay Area, how much the office would cost you. And if your employer um, you know, doesn't even give you an allowance for co-working space in Colorado somewhere in Denver, you just compare the cost. It's all the you know, numbers game at that point. But really, the cost is going to be much cheaper. And the talent pool. You really, th this is one of the things that people actually bring up remote work. It actually encourages inclusion and diversity. Because sometimes some people can just move across the country because they have kids going to school or there's like a special circumstances or there's like, you know, uh, health issues involved. Uh, it's been shown that it, when you're able to work remotely and supporting uh, people from you know, all, you know, paths of life, it's really beneficial to all of us and also to the employers if you want to be you know, more pragmatic here because you can choose from more people. All right, it's been kind of a nice breather. Actually, let me breathe. <sighs> nice breather. Let's talk about something more aggressive and kind of dangerous. You know, it's been the, late, the least dangerous thing I've seen is like a deer, but also there are some bears roaming around. It's kind of been scary. So let's talk about some more abstract stuff. Dangers of remote work. So, first we will talk about the perception of distance that people often have when working with remote employees. Procrastination, the common problem. Constant distractions when you work from home. And lastly, the loneliness and isolation. That one is a tough one, for sure. So, and one thing I want to make sure I clarify. When we say remote, and I kind of try to talk about later on, but I don't say completely like I'm gonna leave you know because I keep bringing up Colorado because I mean we're in the mountains I can't not say that but okay let's say actually in Banff cool let's say Banff you know I'm not saying you start as like let's say junior engineer working remote from Banff um, never see your team I'm not saying that uh, really you can start slowly by doing hybrid where you're doing some, you know, couple of times a week, or you're still going to the office in other days, you're slowly transitioning. There are many ways to do it smoothly. So when I say remote, I don't say completely cut ties with your team, never see them ever, which is also a possibility, but remote is kind of a broad statement. And I'll talk about it a bit more later on. But I just want to make sure we clarify that upfront. Okay, let's dive into one of the dangers, perception of distance. Ah, how often have I heard that thing? So are you remote today or another work from home day? You know, it's like the, these days companies more often than not have that w Wednesday work from home or Thursday work from home. And people think that oh, work from home means no work done. It's an extremely common statement I hear or a question I hear. But the thing is, it all comes from this point where more often than not people really uh, thing that work has to be collocated, physically collocated, where when I go to the office, my uh, you know, desktop has to stay, has to be basically near my thigh somewhere. You know, it has to be close by or that uh, an Apple computer, which I'm not going to describe, but it looks kind of different. Um, but anyways, people often have this misconception, it has to be close by, even though more often than not, the data you connect and trying to work with, it's somewhere like, you know, miles away. 
kilometers away. We're in a metric, metric system right now, which is great. Kilometers away from you. So it doesn't even make any sense. But unfortunately, people have that mixed misconception because today there is no way you can say work is always next to you. Because we use email, we use Slack, we use distrib we have distributed teams. I've never worked in a team where every single you know um, teammate of mine was in the same office as I was. There would always be some person in the office somewhere else. Even if it's hopefully maybe it's within the same time zone, but more often again. Quite frequently, it would be someone in Europe, someone uh, in Dublin, uh, or wherever. You have to work with people in distributed teams. And even the idea, very idea of this very common thing of this, you know, software as a service, it's the whole premise was not to have anything on the premise. So it just, it just doesn't make sense. The work has to be physically collocated with you. You have to avoid this notion that my horrible drawing, it's actually not even drawing, my ho horrible diagramming skills, but you have to avoid this notion that you and work, there's like some break between and to kind of remove this fence, remove this separation, you have to be collocated. In reality, there is no you know, disconnection. You don't have to be in the same building to interact with work. In reality, wherever your office is at, whether it's co-working space or your home or you know, I was sitting there on a, on a red chair over there. You know, wherever you are, there, there is a work that for you. So, unless you're working with physical devices, obviously, but even then, there are ways around it. You can bring it with you. So how do we do that, actually? How do we able to kind of uh, remove this separation? Because again, anything, any kind of misconceptions, especially this kind of idea is that perception of distance, they all come from miscommunication. Miscommunication would cause this vacuum of assumptions about your work, about you not working while you've been at home or in a co-working space. This misconception, the only way to deal with it is through communication. Or more importantly, uh, I have to say over-communication. You cannot over-communicate where you're working with a distributed team. There is no way to do that. Nobody will b blame you for communicating too much. So when it comes to communication, though, there are a couple of points I have to make. And the pretty obvious ones, that synchronous communication is, again, overvalued, or at least it's used way too much. Instead, we have to prioritize asynchronous communication. Like, even if you're in an office with someone, and they, uh, you know, and I've seen people actually shiver every time someone passes by because they're afraid of this tap on the shoulder. Can I ask you a question? That's why. People come up with the rules. I have a, uh, you know, a bandana or a headphones on. You don't touch me. Or like, more better than that, this asynchronous idea. Send me a Slack ping saying I have to. Ch Even if I I've been in this situation, I'm sitting right here. Someone I want to talk to sits right there. I'm not going to tap them on the shoulder because they're going to get a tick really quickly. And so I message them when you have time. Just let me know so they can, you know, when they actually have a. You know, gap on a schedule, they can talk to me, and then I'm going to chat with them. So asynchronous. Emergencies where you have to call someone have to be emergencies. Otherwise, it's not an emergency. People, that's why when it comes to instant messaging, people often <laughs> mis, you know, misconstruct the idea that instant reach communication, they, un they don't understand that instant reach communication does not mean instant response time. The very fact that they can instantly send you a message does not mean you have to instantly reply to them. It doesn't work that way. And you have to make sure you set those expectations straight. You know, again, all the mis miscommunication come from assumptions. Because if there is a vacuum of any kind, especially in, you know, in, so in society, it will be filled with fear and usually wrong misconceptions about something. In this case, if you don't clear it up, they will assume, I ping you, you haven't replied, what's up with that? So you have to make sure you clear it up, you have discussion with your team. And if you're going to do more of this asynchronous communication, kind of a last kind of a note is really put names to faces. Uh, don't just use like, a, I don't know, Twitter used to have an egg. Have like a real face. Because people, again, because of this communication we have online, we often tend to dehumanize person. But when there is like a smiley face on it, like actually a real person, ideally, uh, it's hard to be mean with, uh, to that avatar. It's easy to be mean to the Twitter egg, but when it's a real face, it's kind of tough. So put names to faces. It's been shown to kind of improve the communication a bit more. People, you know, being nicer to you. But again, more importantly than that, make sure if you're stuck when you're working remote, ask for help early on. 
you know, uh, that's one of the essential parts because especially when you're just joining, just starting or you're like just in the beginning of your career, uh, ask for questions even if you start working remote here and there because then again, it's all about the it's creating credibility kind of at the beginning, especially when you transition to remote work. So you want to make sure you ask for question, ask questions, you work with your team, you set expectations, you clarify things. Don't just assume it and go for a long time without understanding. Let's look at another danger, procrastination. I kind of like this tweet though. If you can see, basically the picture says, uh, please don't talk to me, I have no self-control and I will talk to you for two hours and get no work done. It's from Josh, I mean, I don't think a picture from Josh, but Josh Constant, Constant, he's the editor at TechCrunch. Cool guy, uh, fun, funny tweets. Uh, but honestly speaking, what this tweet really means is we always tend to procrastinate regardless whether we're in the office or not. So when people say, oh, I'm gonna procrastinate when I work from home, you're gonna procrastinate when you're in the office as well. It's just about how you set up your home office. It's all about that really. Because when you go to the real office, there are some conditions, ideally, that f I would say force you to be you know, civil and actually work. Because you know, at home I'm horrible when I work. But you know, in the office we're still going to procrastinate. So uh, how else would we explain things like, I mean, how would we explain the fact that we procrastinate at work? If you ever use tweet, uh, Tinder, Tinder has a work mode. You can like press a button and you, because you can do Tinder on the web too. It basically pops up this fancy looking Google Doc, which if you actually start reading, uh, it's gonna be weird. But it's like one of those, you know, like those screen savers kind of thing where your boss is coming, let's show like we're working and start typing something and it has like terminals running. It's one of those things. And I've, uh, you know, and the better thing that I've, sh I've found recently and it's amazing it's, I already shared with our Netflix friend, but the NetflixHangouts.com. There is an app that help, lets you uh, have three windows of people, pre-recorded people on the Hangout, and the fourth being real Netflix that you can watch. That's amazing. <laughs> that's like genuine you know, innovation. So that's one of the things. And if, that, if there was no demand, this would never exist. You know? There is a demand for that. Look at downloads. It's actually you know, a plugin for Chrome. So there are downloads on that thing. Because again, it doesn't matter where you are. Really, I like this st statement by Joko Willick. It's the discipline equals freedom. And I talked about the importance of freedom. Uh, Joko Willick is that uh, he, ex-Navy SEAL, has a big podcast, kind of a hardcore guy, if you be honest. That being said, I like some of the statements he makes in that regard, at least in terms of the discipline. He's like, you know, make your bed, those sorts of things. Because uh, again, ultimately, it all comes from you. Because when it comes to being in the work mode, whether you're at home, in this case, when you're working remote, let's assume you're at, at, at home, you have to set some rules, like you have at work. You have to have work clothes, whether it's some special pajamas or some special like hat. When it comes to clothes though, you know, if you have a webcam on, make sure you have like, you know, shorts or something. It, it happened to me like, oh my God, something in the back like is loud. Let me move that and yeah, make sure you think of that thing. <laughs> So work clothes is very important. And it also sets you into the mood, you know? Uh, if you're working from, from home, I've heard people say, oh, I have a hard time working from home. And a good question to ask, so how often do you take shower? Because people sometimes, when they work from home for weeks, just don't sh take showers for a week because they don't have to leave home at all. <laughs> have a work laptop. Again, the separation kind of a work, have this work-life balance, which is extremely tough when you work from home. Because home is basically your life and also work now. Have the separation, have a separate work laptop. More importantly, have a work office. If that doesn't work for you, go to a co-working space, go to a coffee shop, go somewhere. I actually seen there's like Airbnb, but for work table now. You can go to someone else's house and sit in there. It's actually a thing and sit on their desk, rent it and work from there. They have bananas and coffee, they said, and I'm not coming. But it actually was my major problem. I've tried to work for a full-time remote and I struggled greatly because my work office was a table, Ikea table, not to bash on Ikea, Ikea is great, but it was the same table that I used for, you know, watching Netflix, for uh, work, then for uh, eating, everything. It wasn't, you know, I used the table for everything. So really, it doesn't set you in a mood right. You have to have a separation, ideally separate room, or maybe a balcony. Some people create it in the balcony. Like this balcony is good enough. It's more than you need. 
and also establish work hours. If you're working remote with a distributed team, make sure they know what hours you're working. Make sure that you communicate your status. If you're leaving, I don't saying that you have to constantly be on the phone. That's, that's, that's horrible. Uh, instead, you know, have a status, I'm away from my desk, or have that overlap hours with your European team if you have a European team. Two hours is more than enough. You can do four, great, but it can be challenging sometimes. Again, enjoy your freedom though. Um, go for a walk. Uh, I heard pets help a lot when you work from home because you know if you have a dog uh, and it has to go pee uh, and you just for a walk, bring it for a walk, it really sets you like, okay, it's time to actually move because when you sit at home, you might just end up again sitting for too, way too long. So really enjoy your freedom at the same time. Another thing is constant distractions. Kind of brought, brought up pets, but they can be also part of this thing as well. Again, same as before. We're gonna always have distractions, whether we're in the office or at home. So you can't really blame the remote work for that. So, but again, what matters the most in this scenario is how you deal with those distractions. So let's look at the dis potential distractions we all face, whether we're in the office or at home. One of the things, mobile devices. Oh, it's right here, mobile devices. Noise control, how do you control noise? So you have to set boundaries, and how do you do that? And lastly, how do we get in the zone? How do we remain in the zone? Let's look at the devices first. It's a, it's a major distraction of our generation. So, I say so a lot, by the way, if you never, haven't noticed. It can be a good drinking game, though. I'm, I've been participating, for sure. <laughs> so, before, I used to have this horrible situation. I mean, not exactly. I never had Tumblr. Never. But it was similar. These bubbles give me anxiety right now. I can't even look at that, you know? Uh, but in reality, more often than not, people have those enabled. I have a work phone as well. I don't have notifications enabled. Um, especially if you have like some devices. When I leave work sometimes, I disable the um, email, work email that connected to my phone, which is kind of defeating the purpose of corporate phone. That being said, it's my phone anyways. Um, disable notifications. It will help you greatly. Uh, now my phone looks something like that. Kind of a, is it OCD thing? Kind of, it's like organized by, uh, you know, groups and stuff. But what, I'm, what the summary of that thing that I just showed you is that you have to arrange your apps. It really helps. But more importantly, arrange them and the most distracting ones move to the next uh, window over. Should never be on your main um, screen. Like as if you look here, in the very bottom, those highlighted um, apps, right, these guys. There is no messenger, there is no, um, I don't know what else people use, email with a pop-up because when I, I, I used to do it a lot where I would just, okay, I'm bored, let's look at my email. Uh, you don't want to have that. Uh, but if you have to even spend a second thinking about where the app is by just swiping right once to the second screen over, uh, in this case, where the heck that was? See, it's not even on the second screen. It's on the third screen, actually. Uh, but when you have to swipe a couple times, your brain kicks in like, oh, wait, 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 let's stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So really arrange your apps for the better. Disable notifications, you don't need them all the time. Emergencies, they will call you, and hopefully for a reason. Give them a strike policy, you know? If they call you for no reason, you know, it's a strike one, you know? <laughs> Always have the not disturb mode on. Who's gonna call you? Ghostbusters, no. But like, you know, it's, uh, the only people call me these days is basically, it used to be CRA in Canada, tax agency, now it's IRS. IRS. But like, you know, they like keep saying, we're gonna come for you, or you want a Hawaiian trip. <laughs> like, that's the only people who call me. And again, because everyone just uses text, WhatsApp, or whatever. So really, do not disturb mode will help you with that. And put your phone away. That's actually a great tip. I, I found, you know, I've read about it, but also I've used it, and it works. If you sit on your desk, right here, for example, you have your phone, measure the length size uh, of your arm. So put your phone one step away. Put it there. I'm such a late, I'm so lazy. I'm not gonna, and most people are, they're not gonna move, uh, like they'll try to use the force, not gonna work. <laughs> and they will never stand up actually to move, because I'm so confident that the, the chair, or if you stand in this, nobody will move for the phone. So if you just put it that far, it will, it will remove the temptation grabbing it all the time. Really helpful. How do I control the noise? Another thing, because that open office, right? Oh. Meaningless noise is actually handy. The reason why we say we can go to the coffee shop and work, sometimes without headphones, 
is because that noise is different from the open office noise, because that one might be related to your work, might be related to you, might be related to your business. When you talk in, in the, when you work in the cafe, coffee shop, different situation. Unless you work in a coffee shop at your company, then it's like defeating the purpose. Uh, sound support, that's important. You know, there are apps like Brain FM, great app. I, it's like, a, it's, some, it, it, it's free for a couple sessions. Uh, I bought it because I'd use offline mode on, on a plane, but it has like a meaningless noise, basically. No words, nothing. You can use Spotify or some white noise machine and stuff like that. Whatever works for you, but you know, whatever gets you in the zone. My body really listens to like hardcore like metal, and that's like, I don't know, it's uh, screaming about suffering while he working in the legacy code. It's kind of matching, but <laughs> I've seen that and it's funny, but in reality that's actually works for some people. Oh my God, I should never put ice in that. Uh, noise cancellation. Um, solutions for noise cancellation. Obviously, we all know earplugs, it's kind of a budget thing. Uh, earmuffs, I love the construction level ones. You know, you can like basic, the ones I have, I can lay asphalt and then work on a code. It's not gonna bother me whatsoever. Uh, noise cancelling headphones, like, sorry for the styling, but noise cancelling headphones also can be a thing, but they're expensive. Um, the thing I have is me on a plane, Kind of tired. That was at my dance conference. But this is what's important. Not these cheeks. Oh my god. But like these th these headphones. They like cost like forty bucks, Canadian bucks, by the way. Uh, and <laughs> and like they connect to the. You can connect to your phone. Listen to whatever music you want. Podcast. But no kid would ever disturb me on a plane. No one. No one. It's like I, I'm like basically an armor here. Uh, li set library rules on your office or even at home, you know, uh, where basically have a keep quiet area. If you're in the office outside, discuss it with your family, discuss it with your colleagues and have this asynchronous ping, especially if you're still in the office. It's probably going to be complicated when you're with your partner, like ping me first before knocking at the door. I'm sure if you've seen that CBS interview or whatever that the guy was talking about, uh, something, I think it was BBC where he was talking about, uh, pop, pop, I think North Korea and the uh, child, uh, came into the room and then the second child and the mom grabbed both of them. It was amazing, but you're not being, gonna be, uh, be able to ping you first all the time, but it's a great uh, tip to have. Establish office hours if you're an expert, because uh, people are gonna ping you constantly, ask, answer, me the question, answer my question, please, 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 please. Break those silos, so in other words, try to teach others the, your areas of expertise. If you can't do it, set the, you know, on Fridays every second week, uh, have an office hours, pin me, ask me questions, I'll answer them and we can discuss that. And discuss those rules. Don't just like, okay, in my head, my office hours isn't that time. No, no, no. We're not psychics. We need to know exactly what you're doing. And lastly, loneliness and isolations. Because again, physical fitness is great and all, but um, mental fitness is also very important. Because working from home can be really isolating. Traveling also can be isolating. For I travel quite a bit as well. I'm sure some of you do as well, especially if you're in consulting. Because again, it's all isolating. And loneliness and isolation is a big deal because it creeps up on you, you know? So how do we deal with that? Co-working spaces can be a good idea. Uh, if you're working remote, user groups and conferences. Uh, find a hobby. And lastly, mindfulness in your life. So let's talk about co-working spaces a bit. Co-working spaces, why do we need them? They help you to socialize, really. You can social, you can have that social aspect of work while not being in an office. You might think it defeats the purpose, it doesn't. We are social creatures, we need socializing. That being said, sometimes I think, I'm gonna move to Banff, I'm not gonna talk to anybody, would be great. But more often than not, really, you need that part. It break, helps to break a routine. Maybe you don't wanna work from home every day, you need some social thing in your life, let's go and uh, talk to people. And it helps to deal with nuances like making coffee, printing stuff, booking a room, and things like that. So that's all great. User groups and conferences. You are in a conference here, but just in general in life, you're never alone. With your whatever preferences you might have, you know, uh, there are always people you can share your feelings with, your ideas, uh, as I said, preferences. The whole trick is to find those people. And we are extremely lucky that we have internet right now. Something things like TikTok, which is not for the better, but there's like things like user groups and conferences that help greatly. Because again, you can find whatever you like. Because again, it doesn't matter and it doesn't have to be technical only events. Like this is a technical conference, it's all great. But even here, where there are some soft you know, topics. But again, you don't have to go to tech events all the time. 
There are conferences like GenCon, 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 GenCon. Um, it's about uh, board games. Very famous, very popular. Most of my colleagues go. Uh, never been there. Or if you're into different kind of stuff, there is the Flat Earth International Conference in <laughs> Dallas every year. It's actually coming up soon. It's in November. <laughs> Thinking of going? No. But uh, uh, it's inter website alone is exciting. So I encourage. I don't encourage you to look at the website, but the website is very interesting. But whatever your interest and preferences might be you will find a group to talk about it. So you can definitely try it out. Look at the sponsors part as well. Sponsors are also interesting there. Um, <laughs> hobbies, when it comes to loneliness. Hobbies are extremely important because need, we need to unwind for our daily routine because routine is what's killing creativity, apart from other things, but the routine really kills that. You have to find a hobby of some sort. Um, new skill, because we, you know, Life becomes really mundane when you master. You can't really master many things, but when you think you mastered it, it's already have the, the path where you, you need the challenge. You need to come up with that beginner's mindset uh, here and there and try out new things. And that's a really exciting thing. And it doesn't have to be technical, you know? Personal story, I used to be in a medical school. And when I, w I remember uh, to this uh, day, I had a talk with my uh, ER uh, practical doctor, whoever, it was a surgeon, and he was fun. Very fun guy, but he shared with us that the only way to stay sane when you go through all those horrible things that we've seen, and I've seen like almost nothing compared to what he's seen, but the only way to stay sane is to do two things, arts or sports, and he was like buff musician, so he doubled down on both. But you have to like unwind in some way or another. And more again, another thing, mindfulness. Mindfulness. I know it's a t cheesy word these days and all. You can you imagine like two startup CEOs sitting in a room. Uh, no, no, in reality, it's actually extremely, it's extremely helpful because it helps you to clear your mind, control your emotions, um, embrace your solitude, and lastly, incorporate meditation. So when I say mindfulness overall, really, it's uh, about being in the moment in simple terms. But you know, I'm not going to try to define it. It works different for different people. But let's talk on these points. It kind of helps to understand a bit more. When it comes to clearing your mind, really, we are struggling these days with information overload. Too much information. This is a 141st slide. So much information. Horrible. You know, don't have that. <laughs> By the way, I now work from the office. I used to work remote, so I'm a hypocrite. So don't, please don't complain about it too much. So yeah, information overload. Try to avoid that. Information dump, where you have you know, hundreds of notepads throughout uh, your house where you write to-do items. Don't have that. Have a single source of truth. Have a single app like Evernote or an Apple Notes. Have something that, where you record all your notes. Because if you have to start worrying about the thing that was supposed to help you stop worrying, it just becomes, I don't know, ridiculous. And keep it single focus. You know, you should not. The multitasking is overrated. We all know about that by then, by now. Uh, if you're interested about learning about this concept more, this is a great book. I love this book. It's a bestseller. He's right, he actually published just a new book recently. Um, yeah, it helps you to prioritize things in life a bit. Control your emotions, another great thing. This tweet was amazing. Uh, Jeremy Ashkenaz is an amazing person. He created CoffeeScript, Backbone.js, and a bunch of open source stuff. Great dude. He publishes this lovely picture, enjoying the sun, jumping into the water, and someone left a very nice comment. A comment that I'm not gonna repeat. But, you know, you're gonna, ha that's why we say you don't read YouTube comments. Uh, that wasn't YouTube, that was just him posting a picture of him enjoying the sun. You're always gonna have people like that, always. That's why we have to focus on the positive side. Really, there is no reason to be rude. I'm happy to speak in Canada, so it's everyone gonna understand that idea, but there is never re the reason to be rude. Really. There's a cool thing called Art of Unsent Letters. It's uh, been popularized uh, from this, uh, from like a story about Abraham Lincoln that way back he uh, would write, someone upset him greatly, he was some general, he would write a letter uh, to him like your, you know, very intense letter at first, but he would never send it. And he would write a second iteration, third, fourth, maybe the fifth one, which has like, he was able to calmly think about it and then he will send it kind of iterative, ag real agile, I would say. But you know, if you're gonna practice that, make sure if you do it with emails, the to form is empty. <laughs> More often than not, it's like, ah, oh, you're gonna send it, it's not gonna be uh, pretty. That being said, these days you can fortunately unsend letters, which is nice, but it's only like within a short window. 
Uh, focus on improvements is nice. You know, we finish the projects. Let's see how do we make, do we do it better. Sometimes it doesn't work talking about all the time. Talk about what went well. You know, finish project. Let's first celebrate successes. Who did, you know, what went really, really well. And let's not think how do we go do it better. Let's think what we've done really, really well. And give proactive, positive feedback. People will remember that. More often than not, we jump the gun to give a negative feedback. We're, you know, very unlikely and very infrequently we give someone a feedback, you've done a great job. So do it. And if you want to read, like there is a great talk by Brad Cannon on kindness and open source. Uh, and there is a whole podcast with him. So that's great. And it comes to, again, uh, embracing solitude. That's an important part of being mindful because you have to embrace quiet moments. Be with yourself. Flow therapy is an amazing way to learn about it. It's that sensory deprivation tank. Laying in salt water with no light, no sound. Sounds freaky to some people. It's amazing. I love it. You can also combine it with other, you know, you can make it even a better experience. I'm not going to talk about it. But there, it's a great, great therapy. It helps a lot. Because it helps you to learn about yourself and really have a clear judgment. When you are able to stay alone with yourself, you are not afraid of making decisions like, I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to be remote. I'm going to make a change. If you are afraid of being alone, even work-wise, it just, it can be unconscious because consciously you can calculate whether you can afford doing that or not. But unconscious mind is what really drives us more often than not. And lastly, meditation. I'm not going to talk about it too much because there are so many ways to do an unguided, guided, active meditation. More important idea is to keep it consistent. And if you've never tried it, there are great apps like Headspace. I use it myself. Love it. Uh, relax meditation. There are some free apps like Calm. You can use it uh, for free as well. And if you think it's skept you've been skeptical, you know, it might be too religious for you. Or there is a great book, 10% Happier by Dan Harris. Um, he, um, you know, uh, this book tells his journey, and he's in no way, uh, you know, um, religious towards the meditation. So to all summarize overall. Simply, you have to stay healthy to be able to work remote and avoid those dangers. So, with all that being said, let's talk about starting with remote. I hope I was able to convince you at least give it a try. So, let's see how we start. When it comes to getting started with remote work, how do we find it first? Ideally, again, you start with your current company, but let's say you have to find a job. How do we get paid? How do we, what tooling we use? And lastly, how do we create our personal office? Let's talk about the job. So best way to find a remote job, really, is just ask your current employer to try out to do some remote work, or maybe once a week, and do it on a trial basis. Set some uh, criteria, discuss it. More often than not, they will be happy if you are able to convince them. And there are lots of articles on this topic, how to convince your boss to give it a try. Well, look at the job boards. I have a bunch of job boards linked in these slides that I will share. You can give it a try and uh, read uh, those as well. There, is a, there are a ton of jobs for that. But again, remember, you're not alone when it comes to searching for the job, the lot, especially for the remote job. From the Stack Overflow survey, the latest one, 53.3%, more than half of all developers said the remote option of work is extremely important to them. It's a top priority. 63.9% said that they work at least once a month remotely. And 11.1% .1 said that uh, they're working full-time remote. So, you know, full-time too tough for me sometimes, but again, I like to combine it in hybrid. But again, it's becoming more and more popular. It's hard to deny that. How do we get paid? To that topic, let me tell you a story. I'm from Vancouver. I love Vancouver. Vancouver is great, even though I had to move recently, but Vancouver is awesome. People often complain that Vancouver is rainy, but honestly speaking, the only rain that I personally like is money rain. So, let's talk about getting paid. Uh, money is important, obviously, to us. We can't just, you know, talk about the greater good and stuff. Money is still, again, essential, one way or another. So with remote work, pay often, more often than not, really location-driven. Especially when you just begin, you will find that that's true for lots of positions. Um, there is an interesting thing I like to refer to initially. It's that uh, GitLab has a nice online calculator to calculate the salary, and they have a nice math, and a huge write-up on how they came up with that uh, math. But it's a good starting point for you, apart from Glassdoor and a bunch of other forums, or PESA, and, but companies still focus on geography. That being said, there is always room for negotiation, especially as you 
progress in your career. You know, as you start become more professional, you know that you have experience, you can always negotiate. Negoti you know, negotiation is the great skill. I would definitely invest in that. Not any less, maybe, maybe even more than your technical skills. What tooling do you use? That's a great, great question as well. When it comes to tooling, there are lots of tools for remote work. Fortunately, you can work remotely on building those tools, so there are a lot of remote tools. There's a great website called remote.tools. You can't make it seem easier than that. And they are organized by categories, completely free, tools for whatever problem you face. Whatever problem you face. And they have more and more popping up every other week. So give, take a look, find what works. Maybe it's gonna work even for your team in the office, but the URL itself is easy to remember. But again, experiment and find what works for you, but more often than not really, even for remote work, sometimes keeping it simple is what's gonna help your transition to be successful. So keep it like Slack, email, and see what you're missing. Brainstorming for software, find that as well. See what works. And lastly, how do you create the, your office? It's always a personal preference, always a personal preference. But one important thing I have to say that especially those who just starting out, never ever be cheap on ergonomics. Ergonomics, whether you're in an office or in a home office, ergonomics is a lifesaver. It's a great thing. You will thank yourself later on in life. So we wa walked through a lot of things, through why remote is important, what the benefits, what's the dangers, how to even get started, at least in the simple terms. But really, I want to end up by giving a quick call for action here. Know your priorities in life. More often than not, death, and, and they should, priorities change, you know, especially when you have some life events happening. But think about it today and see what works for you. Feel empowered though, you know, uh, the market's never been better. Like we all talk about the recession is coming. They keep saying about it for a long time. And honestly, as I've mentioned before, we're in such a great uh, area in IT. Uh, experiment, again, try out a couple of things. Try go hybrid. The books I've linked that in this talk, they have information about remote work. There are great articles on the topic, lots of them. Um, Try out a few things, try go hybrid, see what works once a week. Uh, best, always involve multiple people, just by yourself. Might be challenging unless you're, you know, confident in yourself and you have a credibility build up. It might be tricky, but if you have a couple people, it's much easier to work as a team. You know, someone told me, if you go hike here, make sure you're in a group of three at least, because it's easier to scare a bear. The same goes for remote work. You're not gonna be able to scare your manager who's like, no, 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 you have to work in the office. You have to be able, like, it's gonna help you a lot if you're gonna be in the team. And again, enjoy life. Really, I, I, I know it's kind of uh, cheesy and tacky to say, but uh, work is just work. Uh, freedom and uh, being with your family is gonna help you a lot, you know? And uh, if, you, if you like to work in the place you live now, it's great, but it doesn't mean that you have to work for your local employer. If you're interested in more in different, diff different challenges, working for some other company or travel to like Spain every, every once, once in a while because the company is based there. You can do that as well. But you know, in no way I say you have to move from the place you live uh, and be able to travel. I've, uh, again, I've given this talk in Kansas City. I've never seen you know, more people excited about their uh, you know, uh, city because they would actually have a tattoos like KC and I'm like, oh my, that's nice, you know. I don't have a, I don't have a tattoo like that. But you know, again, enjoy life and see what works for you. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and the, the slides and everything will be everywhere here. Um, please pin me if you have any questions, share information with me and feel free to talk to me. And with that, I thank you and yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Um, if anyone has questions now, we can do that, or you can also feel free to talk to me. But yeah, anyone has any questions? Have some time. Ooh, was it so clear? Was it like, I was like, oh, let's just get out of here. Sort, I mean, I'm actually not blaming you. See the freaking weather. Oh my God, so nice. But yeah, any questions? Please. Has anyone done any real research on companies that don't offer remote, why they don't? Like the reasons you left at the beginning, they seem kind of obvious. And they also seem like, some of the smart companies out there that have offices, is that really all that's talking? Um, I, honestly, some companies I see, uh, especially the big ones, um, more often than not, because they, they okay, so some, some use cases I've seen. I'm sure the people done studies. I've seen a lot of papers on that topic, but 
from my personal experience, I've seen the companies that b focus on the new grads, and I see that frequently in the companies that require you being in the office. Uh, and it's a good idea for junior engineers to be in the office, because you have to get enough knowledge and experience of communicating with people in person to be able to take it to the next level to communicate remotely. So, and the companies that based on the new grad training, they start with an, uh, being in the office. But when I see that, and also offices sometimes can be great. They can be awesome. And they're all over the country. That's how also they kind of try to accommodate just the country, the world. So you basically cut down the cost of focusing on the co-working space. You can go to the office. But a big company, there are very few companies right now that I see that do have to go to the office all the time. Like I worked for Salesforce for a while. Um, was fully remote friendly, you know. Um, <laughs> some companies uh, ask you to go to the office, at least at the beginning. But when you're more experienced, uh, they let you to work outside. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question anyway. But what you, what's your experience? Do you think that's, uh, uh, sorry, I'll just ask you quickly. That, uh, how they transitioned at, at Salesforce, that's kind of, was that like an official, like you've been here this long? No, 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 it was right up front. But also, again, it depends on the team because it's a huge hassle for the managers as well and for the whole organization to uh, be able to train and support the management because it's not easy to manage distributed team that's physically even distributed. When they distribute it between offices, like centralized offices, it's easier. Even that is difficult, but that's easier than when they completely by themselves in separate places because it's a, it involves a different pol special policy, all the way to like how do they expense internet working from home, right? Um, and again, it requires training and to introduce the training to their management uh, is not uh, an easy feat. So, uh, and more often than not, companies promote their ma engineers to the management. So it took some, obviously it takes some time of the engineer having experience working remote, be able to be a manager who can work remotely. I've tried to kind of not manage, but lead a team that was just completely distributed. It's not an easy fit to just jump into. So if the company wants to introduce it, has to have experience or at least be brave enough or have the mavericks that are gonna be able to push and kickstart this idea. So if your company does not, do this sort, doesn't have this sort of perk, you can be the first one who will introduce it to your company. And as I've said, there are articles that discuss that uh, of other people's experiences. And you don't have to be special. It's totally fine. Everyone is special. So, yeah, I, I haven't seen it's been, you know, because of your experience and seniority. And there are some obviously unique, iconic people who can do whatever they want, but that's different. Uh, in general, you can, it's not there because it hasn't been done and you can do it. That's usually the flow. You can definitely try to propose it and give it a try. Yeah, so give it a try. I've tried it, the school works. Yes, please. How do you replicate the whiteboard experience? You know, you get up your team members, you're throwing up ideas, and they're, no, don't do that, try this. It's, you know, high bandwidth communication that you get in the brainstorming situation. How does that sort of work for them? That's a good question. Yeah, the, so if the company has funds, and ideally, ideally in general, you should always get some face FaceTime with people, where uh, every quarter, every couple months, you actually get together, you do major brainstorming events where you can discuss the release or a couple sprints at least. If you do it fully remote, there is some software that people use. We have a kind of, a, we had like kind of a, in the company of kind of things like, basically interactive whiteboard. It's nothing special there, but we would use mind maps where we can kind of brainstorm in a sort of a map or we just uh, jump on a call. More often than not, because we kind of all have a, so what we do usually, we, uh, before we go in person meeting, we would have um, a spike discussions. Someone tries out a new feature, experiments on that, gives it, does a spike. Uh, then we would have a discussion online before the in-person meeting to make sure everyone is on the same page in terms of, for this feature. So we, we don't waste time getting to the context. And then when we get in the room all together, if it requires a major brainstorming event like whiteboarding, we will definitely try to prioritize that kind of a event. But when it has to be remote, unfortunately, and it's again, not the same experience as you said, you can use the online software for that. But again, if you have in person, and you should definitely have in person time here and there, uh, make sure that's prioritized and very, very structured. And if everything you can do remote before the meeting, you definitely do it. Yeah.
And if you actually have a device with a pen, like any of those shared whiteboard things, they work quite well. It's like if you're trying to draw with a mouse, that it gets super clumsy. But yeah. Yeah. And st st stylus cost. Stylus? Stylus? Those things cost nothing almost. I mean, especially, like, obviously, if you go to like Apple pen, it's going to be expensive. But if you go like, you know, one of those regular pens that have like a rubber end, but you can do it. Yeah, OneNote is another one, but like there are tons. Of, there's like some, there's the video conference software alone, there's like hundreds right now. Uh, so whatever works for your team, experiment on that. But again, I just try to prepare for my in-person meeting as much as I can. Are we, do we have to run? Okay, cool. Any other questions? Good question, good question. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.